interviews we are basically going um kind of you know randomly and arbitrarily through friends of ours <laughs> and, <laughs> and today uh we have john mark mcmillan my friend a dear friend uh who i've been on the road with and he is let me just say this guys he is wild <laughs> no i'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but but uh john welcome john mark welcome. yeah thank you Dude, Man, it's so good to talk to you and good to see you. It's been a minute. Dude, it has been uh it has been a while, man. I uh, gosh, I just uh <clears throat> I remember all our conversations, you know, when we were on the road. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and and I just dude, I love the way your mind works and I love uh how you think about things and um yeah, so I really and I really I appreciate your music so much and and you as an artist and so this is a privilege this is an honor for me to get to interview you. Thank you for accepting it. And uh, <laughs> and you're at home. I, 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 I am. Yeah, that's one of my kids. Yeah, he, awesome. he, he came in and ducked, but yeah. <laughs> Perfect, dude. Well, so I just want to, uh, first of all, start out. Some of our fans or, you know, people watching might not know um, all your stuff, your background, your history. Um, basically, I just want to know, you know, mm -hmm. For starters, how did you start off in music uh, as an artist yourself? Kind of what's your story, your artist? Sure. Story there? Well, it depends on how far back you want to go, but I'll try and be quick. I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a cough. No worries, man. <laughs> it's hanging, hanging around from the holidays. Yeah, but, I think um, everybody's sick this year. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but um, so I remember... Um, one afternoon, I was probably 15 years old, a good friend of mine uh, came by the house. His mom dropped him off, and he jumped out of the car with a red Squire Stratocaster and a PV Rage amp. And I was like, what are we doing with this? What is going on? Yeah. He came up to my room, and it was very hot. It was very hot out. We didn't want to play outside. It gets really hot in the south in the summer, and especially in the middle of the day, it's just no fun. So, um, right. He started playing <clears throat> songs from the radio, Weezer and R.E.M. and Pearl Jam and all the stuff <laughs> that was on the radio when I was 15. Um, <laughs> and it blew my mind. Absolutely blew. I saw him. I was like, you're playing. You're making. I thought music, music was magical. Right. I, I thought, like, you know, like, there's this magic thing. And here's this guy I know, and his music is coming out of his hands. Right? He was making it, and it sounded like it sounded on the radio. And I thought this was, <coughs> I thought, excuse me, <coughs> I thought this was beautiful, you know, this yeah. was beautiful. And I was like, I want to do this because I wasn't very good at sports. And I thought this would be really impressive to the girls if I could play. <laughs> like my buddy Mark was playing. I was like, this could be really great. So, so you, were, you, me. you were that guy. You were the guy that shows up at the party and starts playing his guitar. Well, <laughs> I wanted to be that guy. <laughs> It was a long time before that happened. And by the time I was capable, I was not so interested in being the guy at the party with the guitar. But <laughs> um, but it showed, I, I realized, like, oh, this is a thing that can be done by human beings, not just um, magical, you know, music, um, you know, aliens, you know. Like, this is the thing people can do. I was like, I want to be a part of this. So I started playing it took a long time i don't know that i could ever quite play like mark he was really good but um that's kind of how i got into music started playing occasionally at church i think um, my parents were real excited for me to play at church as they were pastoring a small church and i was uh growing my hair long and wearing nine inch nails t-shirts sitting on the back <laughs> you know, friends and i actually wasn't a bad kid but i wanted to look bad you know? <laughs> Parents always tell me they're like, you can look like hell as long as you don't act like hell. So you just start acting like hell, you're gonna look how we want you to look. <laughs> exactly. My dad's favorite favorite thing to say. That's so I wasn't a bad kid, but not interested in God pretty much at all during that period of my life. Yeah. But I thought it, you know, um, I they let me play on the worship team. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, I liked a lot of the guys from the worship team. They were older guys, family guys. 
they all grew up playing in the 60s, you know, and so they taught me, we'd sit out on the back. Um, the church was in like a storefront type, <coughs> excuse me, storefront type building. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you gonna, you're going to make it through this interview? Or are you going to survive? I'll, I'll get that out. You can edit. I'll, I'll make it. I'll, it comes and goes. Okay. So I sound like I'm dying, but it's okay. I'm actually no, feeling good. better. You're good. Yeah, but um, so we'd set out on the back on the loading dock, and the, they would teach me, you know, like Eric Clapton songs and songs from the 60s. Um, and, you know, I got more and more interested in, um, you know, in, in playing music that way. And I, I had this sort of, I mean, it came in phases for me. There wasn't like this one moment when I was like, all of a sudden, I became this person of faith to where I converted to Christianity. I I feel like I've been trying to be saved my whole life. And I, I remember being a kid on the swing set just praying to make sure I pray every day that I'm saved. You know, wow. like to make sure I did it right. <laughs> you know, I'm on the swing set. and <laughs> All right, Lord, make sure I'm saved just in case I sinned or something. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I want to make sure I said the prayer every day, you know. You know, and so I had these little sort of fits of spirituality as a kid, you know. Um, you know, actually, when I was really young, I was probably seven, there was a guy who would come through and play at our youth camp that I'd go to. And I, I always loved church, man. Even when I really wasn't interested in God, like, I love church because I love people. And church people, like, are generally pretty good. I mean, I think there are different cultures at different churches, and church gets a bad rap sometimes. You know, because sometimes I, I feel like sometimes something bad happens in church and all of a sudden it's like Christians take all the heat. And I'm like, bad things happen anyway. Right. Right. But I my kids get lost at church and get lost at the mall. You right. know, <laughs> but I just tend to tr generally not saying that there aren't some really terrible people who call themselves Christians. But generally, like my experience in church has been net positive. Right. Yeah. So I really liked it. I really enjoyed church because of the people. Right. Even when I wasn't very interested in God. But so I was at this youth camp that they're having at my church. And there's a man who came through. Um, his name is Ken Helser. Is, uh, he's actually, if you know Jonathan and Melissa Helser, he's Jonathan's dad. Okay. So wow. they wrote the No Longer Slave song. And they're good friends of mine. They've been friends of mine for a long time. But wow. um, his dad came through. He was a worship leader and musician. And <clears throat> he'd recorded some songs. And, uh, had a musical career and uh, he'd come through and he was playing and I remember as a kid you know like I wasn't I wasn't trying to think that it was cool you know and my friends were all you know I don't know we're probably 10 years old like we don't think anything's cool yeah, yeah. not interested we want to be silly right I wasn't interested in what was going on and out of nowhere like I started crying in front of my friends I mean for no reason and I was having a good time I had no idea what was going on crying and crying <clears throat> and before I knew it the weekend had gone by and I I guess I was having some sort of like spiritual experience right wow yeah oh, and so that's the very first time I felt what I'd consider to be the Holy Spirit you know right um and interesting enough like I I think jumping ahead like even as a songwriter now I'm always looking for that exact feeling for me that's when I know that I'm hitting on something you know that's why yeah. I that way the way that I felt as a kid. So I had these like fits of spirituality as a kid. I mean, I had these long periods of uh, not caring, <laughs> you know, mostly just concerned about myself. I had a rough teenage. Uh, I, bad stuff really didn't happen to me, but I was just uh, somewhat of a depressed kid, you know. And in the 90s, it was sort of cool to be depressed. So like I fit right in. Right. right. Uh, and so, <laughs> I know, so later on, so I started getting involved. So it's really funny. I started getting involved really in the music because I thought it was fun. It's something to do. I liked being at church. I liked being around the people. I liked playing the music. So I started playing uh, music. And I guess I, I I started to develop a little bit more of a taste for the worship, you know. Well, and I remember I had this, I've had these weird moments. So I had this one moment as a teenager. I think everything is stupid because when I was a teenager, I thought everything was dumb, right. you know. <laughs> especially myself I thought I was really dumb and everything else was dumb. I remember laid down on my I thought church was kind of dumb but I enjoyed it and I remember I was so bored I was at my um 
parents' house, and I was thinking, you know, like it's the summer, there's nothing to do, um, you know, and when you're not old enough to drive, you got to have a friend pick you up or you're stuck. And my parents were home, so I couldn't watch MTV. I was like, God, I really wish they would leave so I can watch MTV. Right. Or I wish I could leave so I could go have some fun. Right. Neither of that was happening, so I was I was bored. <laughs> I remember walking upstairs. I walked into my parents' room. Really, out of sheer boredom, just walked through different rooms of the house. Walked to my parents' room, and I fell down backwards on the bed. Boom, like this. My arms outstretched, just thinking, I am so bored. My hand landed on a book, and I picked the book up, and the book was by T.D. Jakes. Actually, someone had given it to my dad. It's called Loose That Man and Let Him Go. And as a young teenager, I looked at that book and I thought, this is a dumb book. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I was such an arrogant little teenager. <laughs> and I looked, I thought, this is such a dumb book. And I'm like, I'm bored. And to prove how dumb this book is, I'm going to read this book. <laughs> so I opened another book. I started reading the book. And I got hammered reading the book. Wow. Like, so I, all of a sudden, like, I was like, wow. I was like, like, there's more to scripture than I realized. The Bible stories speak to me on different levels. I was like, I didn't realize the scripture could speak to me <laughs> on these different sort of levels. Like, right. metaphor and, you know, the books about Lazarus and taking off the grave clothes. And I've realized as a teenager, reading that book in that moment, I realized that, like, my projection, my outward projection of who I was was not who I actually was. It was like, oh, as a teenager, I was like just slowly discovering true self, false self type right. realities about, um, you know, Christianity, spirituality, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, my teenage brain could call it. Right. You know, and, um, <laughs> and so I had this unbelievable moment, you know, and I, I started to dig in to maybe scripture a little more. The prophetic books were still like really weird to me and they're still kind of weird to me today. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't mean bad, just hard to understand, you know, but then I found things I understood and it, it was a, a gateway. I, I, all of a sudden I started to pray and have conversation with the Lord as before that the conversation was like, are you real? Okay. All right. I'm going to ask you again tomorrow. Answer me. And it's cool if right. you are. I was like, just, just let me know, and I like shape up, and I'm not gonna try and do bad stuff. But while you're gone, <laughs> but you know, if you're real, like, let me know. Right. That was prayer life as a teenager, you know. <laughs> but it it changed into something else. All of a sudden, I was having conversations, talking to God about my day. So I was kind of being formed, you know, into something that looked different. I think. Mean, you know, and I, it must have pushed back to that time when I was a kid, you know, and and obviously must have pushed further back into something beyond me, you know, um, right. beyond my, you know, <laughs> the consciousness of who I currently am, you know, that when God created me, I guess, right, you know, I was pushing back to something. So, well, hang on. So at that point, uh, not long after that, I had to start making some decisions about college and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. So because I was having this like uh, renaissance, I, uh, I decided to go to a ministry school. When I was in the ministry school, we had to write songs if we wanted to play on the worship team. And I'm having this spiritual renaissance, I really want to be on the stage <laughs> with my friends because that's cool. You know, so <laughs> I, got, I got two things working on me. I have actual like Holy Spirit, the Lord, God, Jesus is doing something in me. And then I'm like, my uh, my my ego, my false self is also really stoked. So we both wanted to be on that stage. Right. <laughs> my true, true self and my false self both wanted to be up there. But that's how kind of how it all began for me. Right. You know, in a nutshell. I mean. So, uh, you, got it, so you got involved in that college that you were at. And yeah. Then you cool. start, and then when did you start writing your own material and becoming an artist? Really, it was around that same time. So prior to that. We had had, after I had this sort of T.D. Jakes book, Renaissance moment. Right. Uh, <laughs> TD it, it was, I was at a small church. My parents were great, you know, pastors. They had this little church. But, you know, it's a small church. And the uh, youth pastor, um, who was also the stepdad of one of my best friends in the youth group, he, um, who also really enjoy, I liked, I enjoyed hanging out with him. He was a good, he seemed like a great person. He had an affair with one of the singers on the worship team. 
So brought the youth group to a screaming halt. Okay. Right around this time, I was having my spiritual renaissance. The youth group fell apart. So <laughs> I wanted to spend more time with other kids in the context of, um, you know, like worship or God or whatever. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to I, I went to church, but I didn't know what we're supposed to do. Right. So I just, I made it, I created this flyer. It was like, um, you know, I cut out magazines, you know, like letters from magazines. Yeah. Made this flyer, said, hey, we're going to get together. I think my language was something like, something about a Holy Ghost buzz. I don't even know what that meant, you know, but I thought it sounds good. Was this a Pentecostal church? It was a non-denominational church, but it had semi-Pentecostal roots, I'd say. Okay. Yep. <laughs> my parents um, got saved out of sort of the G the Jesus movement there, yeah. you know, and so yeah. even early on, we sort of lived, it wasn't a commune, but it was definitely commune-like where a lot of people lived together in a community and there was a farm involved, but, wow. you know, but it was not, it was not um, a full-on commune. There was, well, because, that level, yeah. there was not that level of control that you would expect from that type of thing, you know. You didn't move down to South America. <laughs> no, 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 no. This was in Charlotte. It's actually where the Charlotte Hornet, the old Charlotte Hornets uh, stadium used to be, which they've just, they've knocked that down now too. So, okay. yeah, my life is in way in, uh, we're in multiple layers now. <laughs> They're happening in important places. But so, oh man, how did I get there? How did you get all the way back? Well, so yeah, the question was when you started to discover your artistic skill yep. and discover, oh my God, I, I can do this. I can, and then you begin to write music and then it turns, it, it snowballs into an album and then, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yes, okay. So <laughs> my, um, I, I wrote this flyer, I started handing it out and um, we had like a bunch of teenagers my age show up at my parents' house to want to hang out. I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll strum the guitar because I'm learning the guitar. Some of the girls said they like to sing. Um, so I'll let them sing. I'll play the guitar. I have all these vineyard worship song charts from having been playing a little bit in church. So I just grabbed a chunk of them off the stage before church that Sunday. I brought them. I was like, I'm just going to strum. And you start singing. And the girls, when we when there were so many kids there in my parents' living room. In fact, we had to move the furniture outside to put all the kids in. And... Um, so uh, the girls got nervous, and I had to sing to get people started. I was not a singer. Right. Not a, I've never <laughs> felt like a singer in my whole life. You know, definitely. You know, but I had to start to get things going, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't really know even know what to talk about. But we were just sort of exploring our like new spiritual renaissance. With my, you know, friends, with my teenage friends, and uh, and so that's how I got started singing. So the next week, I did the same thing, and I'd continue doing that. But anyway, so then I become comfortable singing. That's how I sort of started. I never meant to. Okay. And I started writing songs, I think, really was around the time I went to the ministry school where the rule was, in order to leave worship, you have to write your own songs. That's oh, sort wow. of the rule. It, well, I, mean, it, I think you could start with other people's songs, but they're like, yeah, after like second semester, like you better have your own songs. Wow. Because that was part of the that was part of the training. Like, you have to have them. And honestly, one thing about it, you don't always know if a song works until you play it in front of people and you see if they connect. So it's a really great school. Right. For, you know, I mean, it's kind of how the Beatles did it. I think. I mean, obviously they did it in uh, strip clubs in Germany. Yeah. But, but for real, they did like their ten thousand hours playing for super demanding crowds. If right. they didn't like what they were playing, they're going to get booed off stage. You're going to have beer bottles thrown in their face. You know. Right. So, it was a uh, way different, so sort of 10,000 hours playing in front of people, you know, songs that worked and didn't work. So I remember um, one of the leaders, he's a worship leader, his name is Leonard Jones. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. He heard one of my songs, and he asked me to play it at a conference. At this point, I'd led worship maybe four times in front of people, maybe a few hundred people. Okay. And at this point, he put me on the stage in front of... 5,000 people, you know, wow. which, uh, Leonard's a smart guy, but I, looking back, I was like, I, I, he must have had a lot of faith in me <laughs> you know, to do that to me, yeah. uh, and he's given me a lot of my oppor early opportunities over the years, he took me to Europe with him and stuff like that, but, cool. um, but yeah, so I remember getting on the stage, and I was mortified in front of all these people, I could hardly open my mouth, Right. I yeah. played the song, and I got off stage, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, it gets a little fuzzy after that, to be honest, 
Because <laughs> I don't know that I was asked to play again for a long time. <laughs> I went to the season where I was, I, I got engaged to this girl, she went to the ministry school and didn't work out and I was totally depressed. I'd moved down to South Carolina to work a job because I thought we were going to get married. I needed a job. And never had like a job job before and I had an opportunity. Um, the whole thing blew up. I moved home because I was totally depressed and didn't have a job, didn't have a car. And my buddy, same friend, by the way, Mark, who had come to my house so many years ago with his red Squire Stratocaster, his grandmother was moving to assisted living and she needed someone to live in her house to keep it up. So he and I moved in rent free. We paid the utilities and the taxes. And so I didn't have a car, didn't have a job, but I did have a free place to live. And so I would stay up all night singing songs because I was depressed and I didn't have anything to do. I didn't have anyone to talk to. I would sit on the porch with anyone until they left, you know. Sometimes we stay out late, you know. After they left, I'd get my guitar and I'd sit out. Even sometimes it was really cold. Watch the cars hit the speed bump on the road right in front of the house. It was always a lot of fun to see who hit it, how hard. Late at night, we saw a fire truck nail it one night. That was fun. But, but I, I kind of learned in the middle of the night, like, you know, God doesn't care about the songs that you feel obligated to write. You know, in the middle of the night when it's just you and God, like, you got to give him something of yourself because he's not really interested in your theology per se when it's just the two of you. You know, because he already knows all that stuff about himself. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and after that, I'm not saying I wrote the greatest songs in the world after that, but it was after that that people started to really care about my songs. And I felt like I had a heart connection. Because I feel like maybe in those late nights I've given, I've learned how to give something of myself to the Lord of music, you know? Yeah. So like, you know, they talk about Robert Johnson went down the crossroads and sold the soul of the devil and, and Bob Dylan moved to the village, right. you know? And yeah. um, for me, it was, I, uh, I didn't get married that year. <laughs> <laughs> came out of a heartbreak moment oh yeah where it was that was your crossroads moment you were yeah. just like you know plumbing the depths of your faith in that moment totally yep yep and years later um you know a friend of mine passed away and i went through a similar sort of crisis you know with him and i wrote another group of songs and that's what i wrote the how to love song was out of that experience so it's interesting how crisis has become a bridge to uh, connecting, you know, yeah. with the Lord, you know, it yeah. seems wrong. <laughs> I have another cough drop. No, I think I like that a lot. Yeah. I, and I, I do relate to that a bit, but I think that, um, gosh, I think that there's something, um, <clears throat> there's something so like phenomenal about your, your gut reaction to something. Yeah. And uh, and I think that that brings out perhaps your true art and yeah, your yeah. true, you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. it's like that yell, like you, 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 you see something that disturbs you and you yell and that kind of yell that you didn't know that you had in you, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's maybe that song that you didn't know that you had in you. Yeah, yeah. It comes out and you didn't even, you don't even know where it came from, but you're just like, yeah, totally, like, you know, and um, yeah. And well, I something, yeah. something in tragedy bypasses all of these uh, ideas of who we are, right? Right. We sort of build up these ideas of who we are to the point where we don't always recognize the difference between who we are and the person we've projected, you know? But something about tragedy, all the ego things, you know, your ego can, like, do a lot for you. I mean, your ego can actually do a whole lot for you, but, you know, next to, like, a crisis... Yeah. You know, a uh, crisis of the heart or a, a loss or an existential crisis. Like your ego can't do much for you. And you sort of have to dig into that part of you that's real. Or you have to build like a really, really bad version of yourself to deal with it. You know, you right. sort of like got to get vulnerable yeah. or you got to shut down, you know. Yeah. And I'm just grateful that I didn't shut down. I could have in a couple of those situations, you know, I became vulnerable. And I, I think some of the most beautiful music comes out of vulnerability. You know, yeah, and I do feel like that's even like uh, I mean, Christ Himself, you know, like it's His vulnerability that connects us and endears us to Him, you know, like it's it's just you know, He saves us by showing us His guts, 
you know, yeah. so that's how he draws us and calls us into the family is through his like insane vulnerability, you know, and God of all things doesn't have to be vulnerable. Right. Maybe he does. That's another conversation. Maybe God does need to be vulnerable. But I think, I, I think that you're, I see, and I don't know if we're, if we're, we, we may diverge on language, but yeah, I, sure. think, I think that personality is a part of your artistry. I totally. think, I think that your, your songs are going to sound um, in accordance with your ego, perhaps. I mean, sure, it, sure. and I, and I mean ego maybe as personality, yeah, you know, maybe just like the, the the positive side of ego, which is which is just your personality, who you, yeah, yeah. you know, how you interpret data in, in that regard. But but I think that at the like the the personality certainly is maybe a superficial version of 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 who you are, not necessarily being the 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 um, the the uh, pretentious version of who you are. Totally. Does that make sense? It's just your your personality is what people see on the surface. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So it's not. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. No. I think I, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, but your songs, like someone else, like for instance, I I've, I heard that Matt Redman wrote um, "Blessed Be Your Name." I don't know if you know that song. Yep. But he wrote that. That song came out of a, a season of brokenness. Yeah. In, yeah in his life mm -hmm. and that's a that's a so it's such a powerful song uh mm -hmm. uh in in its everything in the verve and in yep. the lyric in the music but it's certainly not a song i could write i don't think i could write a song like that i don't know if you could write a song like that <laughs> but 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 certainly yeah, yeah. but certainly it's it's an expression of his personality absolutely as it interprets tragedy right yeah totally <clears throat> totally yeah, and there's just I think there's so much room. I, I think there's there's so much room for so many different types of expressions, you know. And um, there's so much. Um, even the word diversity doesn't do it justice. Like the world is so full of stuff. Yeah. And but people are so different, but it's yeah. so it's so cool that there can be so many different types of songs that work for so many different types of reasons. Right. You know. And, and that's that, actually something to be celebrated, I think, probably. Totally. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's the that's the amazing thing is that, like, you know, for instance, that that song that you wrote, "How He Loves," like yep. that's that's such a glorious, magnificent song, really. Well, thanks. Uh, and it's no, but it, it really it's very comparable to the those those songs that artists that almost define artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think that it's again like we're the subject. Be, and and we're we're subjected to this objective reality called tragedy. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah. I think um, uh, Ben Shapiro has this statement. He says, "Facts don't care about your feelings." But like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm I'm not agreeing, disagreeing with that. But I'm no, just, not sure. I'm certainly saying that facts do exist. Like reality is an objective, external thing to us. Totally. But how? how we as the subjective you know and i'm getting kierkegaardian here but yeah, yeah, yeah sure how we as the, the the subjective interpret that reality certainly as an artist you interpret that reality and out of that comes this this uh this response that is beautiful yeah, yeah. You know, it depends on how you interpret it but you're out of out of you came this beautiful response and so totally anyway, I think that there are levels to reality, like not saying there are different types of reality, but yeah. there's a lot that happens in the world and we're not always prepared to face all of reality at one time, right. you know? Right. And, and so when tragedy hits, you're like, well, I had no, I didn't know that was a thing that could happen. I had heard, so, you know, someone I love could pass away or be, I, I'd heard, I you know, but you don't really believe it sometimes. And, when it happens, you're in such shock. You're like, whoa, I knew in one part of me that this was a reality. This is the world I live in. Yeah. But now I'm exper actually experiencing that reality. And all of a sudden, you're forced to see the world in a different way. You know? Um, <clears throat> That's good. You know, you're, you're forced to see the world differently. And I think for me, I take some things more seriously and take other things less seriously, you know? Right. Um, 
you know, you sort of puts things into perspective. And I think also when you're in that situation, you're, you're kind of raw and your feelings are really available to you, you know, like your feelings uh, in, in loss and tragedy, your feelings are right in front of you. Or they, at least they are for me. And sometimes I'm trying to write and I'm like, I don't feel anything. <laughs> I don't care about anything. <laughs> With lost, like everything, it's like, oh, I feel, <laughs> I got a lot of feelings here. There's a lot to draw from, a lot to pull from, you know. Yeah. And it just becomes a little obvious how you feel about things, and, you know. So I don't know. I could, I could contemplate for a long time why tragedy produces, you know. Then again, I do. I also have friends who are songwriters who tell me they're like, they're like writing a sad song. That's cheating. Like a sad song is easy to write. <laughs> you can write a sad song like it's too easy that's cheating <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, <clears throat> it's uh have you heard that joke about country songs what do you get when you when you sing a country song backwards what you get your house back you get your wife back you get your, and dog. your dog back <laughs> that's right I, I i i agree with you and i think that uh yeah it might be cheating uh but certainly <laughs> but certainly as artists I, I Gosh, I think artists are naturally melancholy. Like, I, I think, yeah. right? Don't you nope. find that? Like, I find I that. So. I think generally, yeah. I so think it's almost, so. Yeah, it's, it's almost a disposition. We're so emotive. We're so emotional. And music is emotional. So it's, mm. it's hard. You know, it's like, if all, you, if all you're doing is, is, I find it, what I find depressing is only singing happy songs all the time. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I, mean, I, I think artists tend to feel things in extremes, you know? Yeah. It's like, and I, have, I do have to remind myself, all right, your feelings are real, but that doesn't mean they're true. Right. You know? Right. Like, all right. I get mad, frustrated, depressed. I'm like, all right, I, I definitely feel depressed. That's real. But, it's, but is what I'm depressed about true? And like, no, not necessarily. Or you maybe, know, so. or, yeah, or maybe... Maybe is it good? In, in, yeah, in, yeah. Maybe, maybe it, maybe it is true to you and yeah. true to your circumstance. But yeah. is is does it is it good? Is, is it is it something that will produce good? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in your life. Okay. Yeah. So that's amazing. What a preamble. <laughs> what, a pre <laughs> what a preamble to the rest of the conversation. This is gonna turn into like. This is going to turn into like a Joe Rogan podcast. I here. know. <laughs> we're, going for, we're going for three hours here. All right. So, 